The Voice of Russia World Service presents another program in the series Christian Message from Moscow. Today we shall animate for you the pages of a church tale. It's called A Priest's Mystery, and it is a true story. We believe it needs no comment. Father John was held in universal and sincere respect in the town where he was a parish priest and religious instructor. He combined the humbleness of a servant of God and the dignity of a Christian pastor. He was meek and mild in everyday affairs, while zealous in everything that concerned his priestly ministry. He loved his church dearly, spared no pains to adorn it, and always entered it with joy and reverence. Father John's wife was a kind and respectable woman who kept house in perfect order and comfortably off without being fussy. When her husband came back home from church or school, she would come out to meet him with her two small sons and receive his priestly blessing. The lamp of God's grace was burning over Father John for a long time, but suddenly it went out. And Father John sank into the darkness of misery and suffering. This is what happened. One winter night the rumor spread around the town that a landowner by name of Ivanov was murdered. This landowner had a servant, notorious for his carelessness. At the night of the murder, the servant, without asking his master's permission, went to the inn, thinking, as usual, that it will go off all right at home, even without him. He came back, after two hours' absence, ready to fend off every possible reproach or accusation. It was with audacity, therefore, that he entered his master's study to take his orders. But what he saw there horrified him to death. Landowner Ivanov was lying on the floor in a pool of blood, his throat cut. His initial shock gone, the servant hastened to the police to inform them about the accident. Immediately a policeman came to the scene. He examined the body and the traces of blood around it and interrogated the servant. It turned out that at the time when the servant was going out for his walk, a priest, the well-known Father John, was seen approaching the house. The policeman rushed away to talk to him. He entered the hall unnoticed by anybody to come upon something that was apparently connected with the murder. In the hall there hung the priest's winter coat, with its fur lining turned inside out and a knife, stained with fresh blood, sticking out of its inner pocket. The light-colored fur, 
bore the marks of bloody hands, obviously wiped up on the fur. When the policeman entered the hall, he was met by the priest himself, who gave him a warm, though somewhat confused, welcome. Hmm. Tell me, Father John, did you go to landowner Ivanov's place today? Yes, I, I did. And do you know what happened to Ivanov after your visit? Yes. I know. No, 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 no I, I don't know. Please believe me, Father John. I think high of your well-known virtue, and it's only my duty that makes me interrogate you. But I hope your answer will repel any suspicion. Do your duty. I would like to ask you, whose coat is hanging in your hall? Yours, of course. If it's yours, then how come it has bloody stains and a blood-stained knife in its pocket? What? It's not possible. With these words, the priest sprang to his feet to run out through the hall, but the policeman checked him, took a candle and calmly walked forward. In the hall, he pointed to all he had noticed and asked the priest. How do you explain all this? Yet thou plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. The policeman made an on-spot statement of all he had found and heard from Father John and moved away. The following day all the town talked about Father John being accused of Ivanov's murder. His faithful admirers refused to believe it. Others were surprised to see how such a crime could find its way to such a good soul, or how long the priest managed to conceal his criminal inclinations under the cover of pretense and hypocrisy. Father John spent most of the night standing and praying. Towards morning, when he finally went to sleep, a knock at the door awakened him. He got up and opened the door. Standing before him was his wife, downcast and tear-stricken. She started to plead with him to tell her what happened to him the day before. With a quick motion, he pushed his crying wife aside and turned away from her. Don't ask me. Don't ask me about that. How can I not ask you about that? I've been your loving wife for so many years. I was happy to serve you. And all of a sudden I hear the whole town accusing you of murder. How can I not know whether you're guilty or innocent? I'm the mother of your children. When they grow up, they will ask me if their father was a criminal or not. What am I to answer? Tell my children, when they grow up, that the father was an honest man, that he never defiled his hands by any unjust acquisition, let alone human blood. You mean you can vindicate yourself from the accusations cast on you? You can explain the circumstances making you suspect? No, I cannot. I should not explain. I cannot vindicate myself. The Lord whom I serve as an unswerving servant has sealed my mouth. He's prohibited my tongue from speaking, and he himself has accused me. How can I oppose him, when if I do, I may lose the last hope to be justified by him? On that day, Father John, as a person under investigation, was put under house arrest, and was deprived of an opportunity to come out of the house or leave the town. His wife's inconsolable grief and the cries of his small children, who cried after their mother, shook Father John. On the third day, after that unfortunate night, he summoned his wife to his study and said to her, Go to the bishop at once, and ask him to take compassion on our children. Give him this letter to his hands only. 
There's nobody except you to do this for me. In it lies a mystery which I can disclose in part only to the Archpastor. I ask you, in the name of God, not to yield to curiosity and to keep both the letter and the reply sealed. It was only two days later that Father John's wife managed to get to the county centre where the bishop lived. He received her. First he read the letter she handed over to him, then heard a plea she made with tears for herself and her children. His clear look of an ascetic clouded and tears walled up in his eyes in response. He withdrew to his inner rooms to write reply to Father John. In a few minutes he came back and gave a sealed envelope to his visitor. In doing so he said to her a few words of encouragement, if it had come to the worst, and giving her his blessing gave her this instruction. Show firmness in temptation. Prove that you are worthy of being wife to a priest. When Father John opened the envelope with the bishop's reply, his hands trembling, he discovered in it his own letter with this resolution of the Archbuster. My dear Father John, do not let the fate of your family disturb you. I will share even my last with them. As for you, our divine Chief Pastor Jesus Christ is giving you the crown of martyrdom for God. Do accept this gift with joy as a guarantee of eternal life and glory. I am rejoicing in the fact that the Lord has given you not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer as He did. This answer did not hold any good promise for Father John's case, but strengthened him in faith and commitment to the will of God. He endured his misfortunes with tenacity ever since, though, as we will see, to a certain limit. One day, a cart with two soldiers stopped at his house. The soldiers were to take Father John to a prison, which was located at the county centre. The priest, steadfast in prayer and faith as he was, calmly put on his travelling cloths and came out to the street where the soldiers were awaiting him. He asked them to make a stop at the parish church where he had served and they promised to do so. Presently, the priest entered the church he had put so much effort in to bring it to perfect order. He looked at the gilded icon screen Here they are, the zealots of the faith of Christ. Hovering over the mole with outstretched hands and nail-pierced palms is the Prince himself, Jesus, who found the faith to suffer disgrace and death on the cross instead of the joy due to him. And you, unworthy servant at his table, you have not yet worked enough to shed your blood. Go now, go with patience and perform the task you are to perform. Saying this to himself, 
Father John felt a new surge of strength and courage. He kissed the altar and the icons and came out to the church, saying to his escort, Now, uh, take me to where you have been ordered. At the county centre, Father John was subjected to repeated interrogations. If he was asked whether he pleaded guilty to Ivanov's murder, he replied, not guilty. If he was asked who then killed Ivanov, he either kept silence or prayed, saying to himself, Oh, Lord, preserve me. If he was asked to explain the circumstances which seemed to establish his guilt, he would say that he could explain nothing, because the Lord had sealed his mouth. He was convicted, after all, for murder to disfranchisement and hard labour in exile. Disfranchisement included his defrocking. The ecclesiastical consistory demanded that he should give a written undertaking not to conduct worship services, nor to give people his blessing, or wear priestly cloths. Father John fulfilled everything, but that was the last drop that overfilled the cup of his suffering. The priest began to groan and wring his hands, appealing to the icon of our Saviour, which hung at the consistory. Oh, Lord, what did I do? Why do you reject me, lest I should perform sacraments before you? And with a bitter groan he fell down. A few days later, Father John, together with other criminals, set off for his destination point. It was a hard journey. They had to walk several thousand kilometers. The work in mines to which the priest was assigned was also hard. But these hardships were nothing compared to his heavy thoughts. When he was overcome by these thoughts, he would cry out. Isn't God righteous? He will not reject me, for I'm innocent. He will reject a hypocrite or an arrogant man who's forgotten about his trespasses. Just recall whether you were innocent when you were ordained to the priesthood. When coming to the sanctuary, were you worthy of approaching God? Standing before his throne, did you not think more of your own self? Raising your hand before him and shedding tears, didn't you entertain the thought that you were in the public eye? The Lord has not tolerated your self-esteem and self-importance. He's rejected you because in your service and teaching you sought glory not for him but secretly for yourself. He's abandoned you in his righteous wrath as a worthless being. And you have suffered little yet, and have not yet drunk up the cup filled with his wrath for you. These thoughts made Father John tremble. He would hide in the farthest corner of the cell, afraid to raise his eyes to the dark icon of our Saviour, the only shrine at that said dwelling. by these thoughts, Father John sometimes heard in himself a weak but sweet voice of consolation. Yes, you were not pure before God, but His grace purified you. His love could make you too His friend. 
Perhaps your misfortune was not due to God's wrath, as Cain's was, but due to the Lord's love, just as Job's suffering was. Perhaps the Lord will yet show the light of his face and reveal his mercy for you. But the voice of consolation was weak, while the voice of severe condemnation arose from Father John's soul strong and unyielding. Many years thus passed. The hard labor was nearing its end, after which Father John was to stay in Siberia in permanent exile. Apparently, he himself was nearing his end. Father John was taken ill with a dangerous disease. Fever and delirium had persisted for several days. In this feverish oblivion he was acting priest. His lips uttered these words. Do not turn thy face away from me. The face of the sick man sometimes reflected an anxiety. Then he whispered. They're coming. They're coming. Ah, oh, they will prevent me again. They will mock me again. In fact, one day the door of the prison hospital where he was lying opened to let in two officers, the chief of the prison and the commander of local troops, accompanied by the prison's doctor. They came up to the bed in which Father John was lying and looked into his agitated and inflamed eyes. The officers asked the doctor to say what he thought about the sick man's condition. The doctor said that the disease required a careful treatment, attentive care and the patient's absolute rest. Any agitation, even joyful, may be fatal. At present the patient was unconscious. After this statement the three men went out. Since that time the doctor came to see Father John every day. Everything that could be done to cure him was done. Thanks to these efforts, the patient survived the crisis. He came to and gradually began to recover. When a favorable outcome of the disease was no longer questionable, the doctor came to see Father John with words which amazed and puzzled him. How are you, Father? My congratulations on your coming back to life. I must confess, Father John, that I was very much afraid for you. How can he call me Father John? What kind of priest am I? Do recover, Father John. You have lived in distress. Now you will live in happiness. I most certainly cannot be happy. Why should I live? Cheer up, Father. Be merrier. The doctor moved away, and Father John thought. What has he taken to call me Father for? I know nothing about it. Oh, I have no power even to think. I'm so sleepy. And Father John went to a peaceful and life-giving sleep. last, the illness was passed. One day he was summoned to the prison chief's office, where two officers awaited him. They announced a change in his fate, and read out for him a decree they had brought. As it has been established that Reverend John, though convicted for murder and deprived of all rights and sentenced to hard labor, did not commit any murder, but showed a valorous self-denial in his priestly service, we order that he be fully acquitted of the crime as alleged through misunderstanding, and that the above-mentioned priest be restored to all rights and released, returned, rewarded. 
In addition, the officers read out a notice from his diocesan leaders, stating that Father John will be restored in holy orders and the position he occupied before his conviction. Listening to all this, Father John first could not believe his ears, thinking he was delirious again. Then he thought he misunderstood what he heard. When all the doubts were dispelled, his eyes poured out the tears of joy and thanksgiving. Exhausted from joy, he sat down and exclaimed, Glory to thee, O God! Glory to thee, O God! Glory to thee, O God! Several days later, Father John left the prison for his long-abandoned and cherished quarters, where the happy half of his life took place. Well, how comes it that Father John was convicted for murder he did not commit? Who was the actual murderer for whom the innocent priest suffered so much? You'll find out in a week's time from our next broadcast in the series Christian Message from Moscow. And now it remains for me to tell you who prepared this program. It was produced by Valentina Doronina and edited and set to music by Tatiana Shvetsova. Acting the parts were James Donaher as Father John, Ivan Sidov as a policeman, Svetlana Yakimenko as Father John's wife, Boris Novikov as the bishop, Mikhail Chernich as the doctor, and me, Carl Watts, as the officer. The author's text was read by Branislav Shulkovich. So be with us at this time in a week. Smiley.